FPA was building, they changed the size of the lot. We'll, we'll get back to that. Uh, of course, in experience of the city councillors, what can I say? In, in, in PA, they don't have an engineering degree, and that's not the idea for politicians. Politicians, they have their engineers that work for them, and everybody goes to the, to the politician, and they say, well, nobody is maintaining my back alley. Oh, the politician says, I don't know anything, I'll ask the engineer. And the engineer, he comes up with a solution. And his solution is most of the time concrete and steel. <laughs> so, but that's how it works. I mean, the politician doesn't have to have an engineering degree. Uh, so they were kind of out of touch with what was going on because they knew the price was going up, the, the expense was there, how are we gonna pay for that? And the mayor, the mayor of, of PA had gone already to London, I'm talking London, England, because that's where the money was, and he tried to sell his bonds there, but he couldn't get rid of the bonds. He went a second time, but that was just before the, the, the Second World War, and he got rid of his bonds at a discount of 20%. So, and the money that he got from that, he had to give right away to the bank because they were building on loans they got from the local uh, Bank of Commerce, I think it was. See, they said, hey, okay, you got money, give it to us now. And then in the end, the bank said, you don't get any money anymore, and the thing, they quit it. Then we talk about the provincial government. In 1905, there was a provincial government in, in Regina, but PA was talking all the time with Ottawa. And of course, I guess in, in Regina, they said, what's going on there in PA? They're not talking with us, they, they're going over our heads, they keep talking with Ottawa. So the provincial government, I guess, didn't like this, this whole thing. And after when, the, when it all collapsed, the provincial government stepped in and they started uh, Saskatchewan Power Commission, and in the end, after so many years, that became Sask Power. And then, of course, the last thing was the First World War. We were in 1913, he couldn't get rid, the mayor couldn't get rid of his uh, bonds in, in London, because in London they knew there was gonna be a big conflict in Europe, and they're gonna need all the money for the war. So they said, well, where are you from? PA, Prince Albert, PA, where is that? Oh, somewhere over there, you know? And of course they didn't get the money. Yeah, the next one. Well, this is, this is just a graph where I put the, the prices that were quoted. And so it is the first phase that he talked about was 429. The second phase would be another 225. And then the third phase, the final height, would be 355. But by the time they started building according to Mr. Smith, they were already predicting that it would cost almost two million. Predicting, because you know how much was built. The powerhouse still had to be built, the canal had still to be built, so nobody knew what was, what was gonna happen there. The, the problem in the meantime had been also that, as I said, Mr. Smith, uh, Cecil Smith, he, he was looking after La Cole Falls, I mean, behind the scenes as the consultant. He died of cancer while they were building. So all of a sudden, PA lost the only man that was really looking after what was going on. It was only Mitchell that was still there. Yeah. Now, I, I didn't talk about that, but uh, uh, Mr. Mitchell, when he did his first survey to, to start building out there, he did one measurement of the river flow, one. And he came out, he made some calculations, because he did that in September, and he made some calculations and he said that the river would produce in the winter at least 130 cubic meters per second. 130, remember. Now, while they're building, of course, then they start more measuring, and in the first winter, they find out that the river is, has a flow of 42 cubic meters. So, why was Mitchell so wrong? Well, that took me a while to figure that out. And it was not, in fact, his fault. Here you see the South Saskatchewan River 
and the North Saskatchewan River and their watershed. Now, all the areas in red, because the Saskatchewan rivers are an exception in the whole of Canada. Everything that is in red is, are areas that do not send their water to the river. They do what they call internal drainage. You know, we all have those hills here, and it rains, and you have a pothole, and the farmer wants to get rid of the pothole, but the pothole is there, and all the water collects in the pothole. It's not going to a creek, and from a creek to a stream, and from a stream to the river. And that's what normally happens. A river, as it goes down, is, 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 is flow, it collects more water from tributaries. It doesn't happen like that on the Saskatchewan rivers. You've got to remember that practically, especially, I don't know exactly about the North Saskatchewan, but the South Saskatchewan, the water that comes in at the border in, on the south, in, in Saskatchewan is, in fact, the same amount that goes out to Manitoba. There is no water coming into the South Saskatchewan. Well, there is a bit, of course. But it's not comparable. So when he did his calculation, he thought, well, look at all that land, because they knew, they knew more or less the watersheds of all the rivers. That's easy to find if you have land surveyors that, that go around. So he calculates, and, oh, there's so thousand cubic, uh, so thousand square kilometers, so there's going to be more water. Well, it wasn't. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, so this was his original idea, and I recalculate, so it's 3.81 meters, half a meter higher than, than the, the, the wheel is asking to. Okay, the next one. So his idea was to build, once everything was working and there was money coming in, he would heighten the wheel to 625. Yes, the next one. So in the end, with uh, Mr. Smith's idea to build uh, Amberson Dam, we are going to 8 meters 23. So another big reason why the price kept going up. Yeah. And here we are at the locks. <laughs> so in 1910, this is the same, I think it's the North Coast that I drew in. I, I forgot I did that several years ago. So in 1910, that was the idea that Mitchell as, as a lock foresaw. Then in 1911, the Dominion government wanted a bigger lock. Then in 1913, what was built, and that you can still see, is this lock. And then in 1915, when they had stopped building, when the whole thing collapsed, the, the engineers in Ottawa, they came to the guys in PA and said, you know what, that lock still has to be bigger. Now you've got to remember, if, you, if you've been there, that's a concrete wall four or five meters wide. So the only way to widen a lock is blow up that, that hump of concrete and build a new. That was impossible. Yeah, I think we're getting close to the end. Yeah, this is in 2009. That was one of the first time that I was there. This is me, 15 years younger. <laughs> this at the time was a city engineer. And this is Jane Remenda, who was later a councillor here in the city. And we went there with Deb Hunch. I don't know if she's here. She was, she said she was going to come. Anyway, uh, we went there with the city engineer, and he had no clue about this either. And I, just before the pandemic, there was another city engineer, and we drove out there. And that city engineer had never been there. Hmm. The city engineers here are not interested. Only the supervisor who has to go out with the grass cutter. He knows a bit about it. <laughs> so, to give you an idea, this wall, this, that's the wall of the, of the lock. On the other side is the lock. So, from the bottom here, up to the top is 12 meters. Now, 12 meters, that is four stories. Four stories high. So you see how high that wall is. Yes, I think. Yes? Yeah. That's the end. Uh, so this is the book. If you guys are interested in buying it, and this is this. I, this year I published two books uh, because I never got any funds from anyone to publish my book. 
and in the end I published it myself. So please buy the book so I can get out of the financial hole that I am. In the, mean, in the meantime, I was luckily when I uh, stopped uh, working on this one, and it was in the drawer for several years during the pandemic, I started work on another book which is now published uh, by Springer in New York. And they paid, they paid me money. They said, yes, we want to publish this. But it's a sketch one. I don't know how many people are interested. You guys are interested in history. But in general, I don't think a lot of people are interested in, in history. So that's why. OK, that's all. Thank you all very much. There is a lot more in the book. <laughs> I didn't talk. I didn't talk, for instance, about what Mitchell, Charles Mitchell, became. He became a big man afterwards. The guy who had no idea how to build this, according to Gary Abrams. He never studied what happened to it, uh, Mitchell after. Mm. But that you have to read in the book. <laughs> <laughs> and if you are interested in the book, we do have copies at the till over here. Uh, a couple more things to wrap up. If you did want to make a donation, that can be change, bills in your pocket, that kind of thing. The box is just over there. Um, for former members and for people who are interested in being a member, there's uh, membership forms at the front desk as well. Uh, remember, this is a volunteer member-driven organization, and it's having a nice healthy list that ensures that we're able to hold events like this today. And that is also at the desk. You can speak to Michelle. Um, a, a huge, huge thank you again for, for Paul for coming here and speaking with us. Um, speaking of something that, that really captures our imaginations here in Prince Albert. Um, and thanks for bearing with me when I first started speaking. I had been hauling chairs up and down and was kind of out of breath, but I've, I've had a chance to uh, rest and listen and, and take this in and catch my breath at the same time. So. I wish you all a great uh, Sunday, and we look forward to seeing you. Oh, I think it's questions. He said, "Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. questions." questions. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what time. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Three o'clock. Three. Three o'clock. Okay, we're on time then. Okay, I think so. Yeah. You have time for some questions? I have time for questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Oh, there's one over there. I'm, gonna I'm, go. yeah. I'm just wondering why did it end up being the city of Prince Albert's yeah. sole responsibility to pay what? all this cost like was it going to be their business to sell this power yes yes pa Should... was built, wanted to build this and they were going to sell the power in pa and then after a while since it became more difficult they wanted even to sell to saskatoon they were going to try to get ele in those days the technology wasn't there but they were maybe able to bring electricity to Saskatoon because you leave you you lose like you lose power on the line and nowadays they can fix that and almost but at the time they could still reach they taught Saskatoon mm. but Saskatoon said no no we don't want to enjoy this stuff because they, in the meantime they had already built a new steam plant they need didn't need the electricity mm. another question yeah after the uh, it was just finally put to rest, how long was it till PA finally paid off the debt? Apparently, I think that was 1965. It took 50 years. But that was in negotiate. First, they negotiated with the, the, the bondholders. And so those people, they lost in the end because they didn't get the full amount anymore. PA said, we're going to pay off at such a percentage for so many years and this and that. So in the end, they lost on it. it it's something like the Panama Canal in, in the days when the Americans took it over. The, the, the French were building it and they lost money too. That, that, was, that was the problem. Somebody else? A question out there. I've got a, two here, and then I'm going to go across over here. Okay, yeah. Hey, um, so the question might be answered in the book. If it is, then we'll make people buy the book to find out. But uh, could you make a comment on any on the construction on the north side of the river? Oh, yes, well, it's in the book, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I give it away. Okay. <laughs> uh, there is a shameless <clears throat> yeah. It's an excellent book, folks. Yeah, then, then you... 
I, I went there many years ago with uh, Bill Weiser, the historian from the university, at the time at the university. We walked, we bushwhacked through the whole thing. You can see the canal. If you go there, personally, I think the north side is more interesting. It's more beautiful because you're, you're in, the, in the woods. But if you know there, you can walk through the power canal. The power yeah. canal was, was dug up, not totally, but for a while. And you could see the dikes on both sides. Oh. And then when you walked, and, and you, it's very easy even to see on Google. Because after they quit, apparently there was uh, pine tree seeds all over. And you could see on Google, it's all pine trees there. So you can date those pine trees to 1913. <laughs> and if you walk the canal, there's, there's young guys coming there and there's, there's rubbish and whatever, but you walk through, at some point you arrive, there's pits, holes in the ground, where they were supposed to build the foundation of the power, the powerhouse. And if you still keep going on, you arrive at the tail race, so the very last part, the tail race was dug out because the tail race, they need the, the concrete they have to bring in. That, that In the summer it was brought in by, by barge, and, but they needed sand too. For, to make concrete you need sand and gravel. And the only place where they could find good sand and gravel was in the tail race. They took the overburden off and they started digging and that's I have more information in the book, yes. <laughs> yeah. but anyway, if you walk through it, the, the, the tail race is there. And you can see that again on Google Earth, that it's a little arm of the, of the river. Okay, notwithstanding that the wheel's totally falling off of everything and it ended up being the situation that it's in, if money wouldn't have been an object and all the problems that they ran into wouldn't have happened, was that a feasible plan? Would we be producing power today if the project was there? If there had been enough money, it would have worked. Oh, okay. the, the, yes, yes. Even, even, even with the, 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 the dam as it's built now and the ideas, it was going to work. The problem would have been, but nobody knew at the time, is that they would run out of electricity quite quick. Because everybody started using it. At the time, apparently, they said, I remember they said that the, they were going to produce electricity, but the city itself was not going to buy electricity to put out lamp posts, lamp posts at, ni at night. They would have had to be the first to build light posts. They were going to sell power to the ordinary uh, merchants and to have electricity in the home at night. That was old at the time. Somewhere the, the system of electricity like we have here had to start somewhere. And the, the whole at the time it was just making electricity a few hours a day. There were, there were no batteries either. So they would use they would use the power canal only I don't I'd say something from seven to nine or ten o'clock at night to produce electricity for the people in PA. Yeah. Right. But first thing, just uh, again, a big thanks for, for, for coming and addressing us. It's uh, a very interesting presentation. But, uh, but my question, a bit different than the others, is, you know, a boy from Belgium, what's your interest in, what was the motivation for you to do what you did to write this book? <laughs> thanks for doing that. Uh, so, <coughs> I happened to marry a Canadian girl. <laughs> <laughs> 45 years ago. Uh, she lived in Belgium. She had done her studies in Belgium, but she was Canadian born because her father was a soldier in the First World War. Mm. And he wooed a woman in Antwerp mm. and they had a baby, like that, what happened with a lot of people. <laughs> and so after the war, remember, they brought all those, they had those ships with just young women with children and they brought them over to Canada. So my mother-in-law was one of them and she had a baby with her and I have still a couple of pictures of that and she drove, my father-in-law lived in Vancouver at the time, mm. so they drove her all the way through Canada to Vancouver and when she was there 
she didn't like the Canadian way of life. <laughs> and after a year, my wife had her first birthday in Vancouver. There's a picture of her with one candle on the cake. She said bye-bye. She went back to Belgium. This happens. A lot of women stay, but she was, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I can't come up with the right word to you. She went back and took her baby along. So my wife, being Canadian citizen, she studied in Belgium, but she was Canadian. And so she, she was a farm, she became a pharmacist, and I met her when she bought a pharmacy in my neighborhood. And she had bought that just, and that's how things start. So I married a Canadian girl, and she became Belgian through me. And she had a son already. And that son was born in Dryden, Ontario. It's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> so he was Canadian too, and through me he became Belgian also. And then, of course, we were married, and we had a son ourselves, which was a Belgian, of course. And, and then in the end, we came over here, which is another story I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> but the, so my wife was Canadian, my oldest son was Canadian, the youngest, we, we made him a Canadian in, in Brussels <laughs> at the embassy, and I'm still Belgian. I said, that is nice. We're going to Canada, but as long as I can, I stay a Belgian citizen. And why did I do that? Because I was a reserve officer in the army and I pledged my allegiance to the King of the Belgians. Mm -hmm. And I thought, as long as I live and I can get my Belgian passport, every year it becomes more difficult, or every five years, to get it, but I do get my Belgian passport, I'm not a Canadian. Mm -hmm. But I think they'll bury me somewhere over here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there are any more questions to come, but. I think Belgians lost is definitely our game here today. They really want to go home with all the rest of it. But really, you have made this very understandable using very laborious yeah. terminology. I've read your book. Okay. Oh, yeah. you He's not going to buy my book. <laughs> you have done a fantastic job, and please, everybody, let's go. The last books I have with me, because I had 100 printed, I gave a bunch away to people that I needed to thank, and I sold a bunch, but the last 20 books I have are here. So, it's your last chance.